Hello everyone. My name is Paul Andre Genes and I'm a publisher at Elsevier. I would like to welcome you to this Bitplane sponsored webinar, which is part of the When Size Matters series of webinars hosted by Elsevier, entitled Passive and Whole Body Clarity for Single Cell Phenotyping. The When Says when Size Matters webinar series focuses on new imaging techniques which enable researchers to study very large samples at cellular resolution. So far, we have covered optical projection tomography and light sheet microscopy. Today's talk focuses on one of the most impressive tissue clearing techniques currently used, clarity. It is my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's first speaker, Dr. Benjamin Deverman. Dr. Deverman is a senior research scientist at the California Institute of Technology. His work focuses on using growth factors and cytokines to stimulate proliferation and influence the differentiation of endogenous neural stem and progenitor cells to enhance repair of the central nervous system following injury and in models of neurodegeneration. Before we begin, let me remind the audience that we will have a questions and answer session following the presentations. Please submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the Ask a Question button on the right-hand corner of your screen. I would encourage you to input questions as and when you think of them. These will be addressed in the Q&A session at the end. The more questions asked, the better the session will be. Without further hesitation, I would like to hand over to Dr. Deverman to begin his presentation. Okay, thank you, Paul Andre. So I will get started. <clears throat> so this image that I'm showing here in this first slide is a cover from a 1994 issue of Science. And it shows a, sim a single C. elegans worm with several GFP positive cells. And each neuron and cell in C. elegans is mapped and understood at a level that those of us who are doing mammalian biology could only dream of. And that such a thorough understanding of an, of an organism is possible is in large part attributable to the relative simplicity of this animal. Uh, but another factor that shouldn't be overlooked is that it's possible to visualize individual cells using fluorescent proteins such as this or immunostaining throughout the whole animal because it's at least semi-transparent. This is an important factor that makes model organisms such as C. elegans and zebrafish embryos so attractive. Although several protocols for clearing mammalian tissues have been described over the years, it wasn't really until the recent publication of the Clarity Protocol by Chung et al. in the Dizeroff lab at Stanford that rendering thicker mammalian tissues transparent really began to take off. And the original Clarity Protocol made tissue clearing more accessible and relevant for work using modern uh, transgenic and viral tools since it preserves the signal from fluorescent proteins as can be seen in this uh, image on the right. So in this way, clarity provides a window into the brain. So it allows you to both gaze out at the big picture, uh, see the overall structure of, a, of cells within an organ, as well as zoom in to the finest details, uh, as you can see here in the image on the right, of individual uh, spines on this uh, dendrite in the brain. So this gives neuroscientists a way of having, I would say, is a way of having their cake and eating it too. This approach is especially powerful in that it is compatible with standard immunostaining protocols. So the image at the top left shows uh, an image from the Chung et al. paper, the original Clarity paper, showing uh, YFP expression as well as parvalbumin staining and GFAP staining for astrocytes. And <clears throat> so this can be used for multiple labeling. And another advantage of this approach is that the hydrogel protein scaffold made uh, with the acrylamide and, and, and paraformaldehyde, this approach protects the integrity of the tissue and allows the tissue to be stained and then stripped and then restained. Uh, in the example at the bottom, the authors actually stain for tyrosine hydroxylase, which is shown in red in the image on the left, and then stripped it using the same solution that they used to clear the tissue with SDS to remove the antibodies. They, you can see the staining is gone for TH, and then they were able to restain for another marker, GFAP, for astrocytes, all while maintaining 
the endogenous fluorescence from the YFP in these uh, in these mice. Okay, so when Viviana Gradnaro, who runs our group and was also part of the original Clarity project in the Dizeroff lab, came to Caltech for her faculty position, she was interested in using this Clarity method for mapping long-range projections between distant brain regions, and she asked Bin Yang, who was in the lab, to take up the task of getting this up and running in her lab. So Bin started by using the original protocol from the Chung et al. paper. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but the way this basically works is it's a three-step process. So first, one takes the brain and, and perfuses it like you would for normal histology, and then takes the brain out and puts it in a solution of with the hydrogel monomers, so with uh, paraformaldehyde and acrylamide and bisacrylamide, and incubates this at 4 degrees, then moves it to 37 in the presence of a, a heat, in that heat activatable uh, initiator. This creates a hydrogel where there's cross-linking between the, the formaldehyde and the acrylamide and this creates a web of hydrogel in the tissue. With this scaffolding in place, then, one can remove the lipids that cause most of the light uh, diffraction by using a detergent, I guess, and they use SDS. And since SDS carries, carries a negative charge, you can speed up the process of lipid removal by applying a charge across the tissue so that the SDS pulls the lipids out towards the positive pole. And so, and this was done using a customized ECT chamber that had ports inserted uh, so that platinum wires can be stuck in and create a, an electrode surrounding the tissue. And then there's, then you have an input and output port to flow the uh, SDS solution through the chamber. So, but using this original protocol, Ben occasionally experienced some of the same problems that others had reported, which was primarily the result of the electrophoresis space removal of the SDS. So this image here is an image that Ben provided that shows kind of the worst case scenario of what can go wrong when you do the electrophoresis based clearing. The problem is, is that the current can create heat, heating of the sample that can be a little bit difficult con to control if not done with care and result and this can result in browning of the tissue, uh, like this rather extreme example shown here. So this renders it both less transparent, uh, but also more autofluorescent, and it reduces the antigen preservation or accessibility. Uh, in addition, the original Clarity protocol also used a reagent called Focus Clear that for, in, for surrounding the tissue with a refractive index media, medium that would match the tissue. And this was rather expensive for this uh, protocol. So there were a couple things in this protocol that could be improved. And Ben was really interested in trying to improve this because he basically thought that doing this the old fashioned way of, cut, of making thin sections and trying to reconstruct projections was way too much work. So he was highly motivated to try to fix these issues. So Ben tried clearing the tissues passively to avoid the problems associated with electrophoresis, and this worked as a test case uh, in the images I'm showing here. He stained a thick brain section of tissue with a tyrosine hydroxylase antibody in red, as well as a CHAT antibody in green. And you can see labeling of different neuronal populations in, these, in the upper and lower images here. Uh, so the advantages of this approach is that it's easier than, than the original Clarity protocol, and there's no risk of browning. But the disadvantage is that it, it's basically the time. It takes a long time to clear and stain uh, the samples, especially if you want to do very thick samples. So Ben wondered, could it be done faster? And so what we ended, what he and, and the rest of us ended up publishing is that is some methods to do this in a more rapid way. Uh, and as Ben tells it, the impatience was a strong motivator for this initial development of the protocols that were published in the uh, 
Excel paper earlier this year. So one way to try to increase the rate of clearing and penetration of antibodies in the tissue is to try to increase the pore size. So Ben had gone up to Stanford to, to the Clarity uh, courses and learned that it was possible to do the, the uh, polymerization step without the bisacrylamide. So bisacrylamide forms connections between the chains of acrylamide. And so in the absence of bisacrylamide, you get long chains of acrylamide, but not interconnections between those chains. And so this gives, in theory, should give larger pore sizes and, and easier access of the reagents to the tissue. And so he started by taking this out and then by adjusting the other, some other parameters of the process. So let's see if I can get this arrow working. OK, so in the, on the lower left, you can see an image from the paper where Ben tried multiple different um, solutions. So the, the bottom solution is 4% acrylamide and 4% paraformaldehyde, as shown here. The A stand, the A4 is the acrylamide 4%, and P is for the paraformaldehyde 4%. So after 20, 48 hours, 24 and 48 hours of clearing, you can see that with this, the original clarity solution minus the biz, the clearing is still optimal at two days. By actually removing the paraformaldehyde from this mix, Ben was able to achieve much clearer tissue. And he ultimately settled on using a 4% acrylamide with no paraformaldehyde. It doesn't mean that this tissue was never fixed. It was first processed by uh, perfusion, and then removed, and then the acrylamide was added. And doing this did, did decrease, or it did increase the pore size. So this is electron microscopy showing pore size with 2% acrylamide, 4% acrylamide, 4% acrylamide with 4% paraformaldehyde. And you can see that this, this condition that we ended up settling on was gives an intermediate pore size. OK, so Ben also looked to see what effect this had on the ability of antibodies to penetrate into the tissue. So you can see here that with the 4% acrylamide and paraformaldehyde, you get less uh, penetration by IgGs into the tissue than you do with the 4% uh, acrylamide alone. What's interesting is that this, and really encouraging, is that the in red here, you can see this bar that this the condition that we ended up settling with, the 4% acrylamide and no uh, paraformaldehyde results in very little protein loss during the clearing process. So been then cleared with 8% SDS, and very little protein was lost. <clears throat> and this is not statistically significantly different from the amount of protein that was lost if you also include paraformaldehyde before you do the clearing. Uh, interestingly, if you don't include acrylamide, but only do a fixation with paraformaldehyde and then add SDS, you get significant protein loss from the tissue. Uh, the same is also true, interestingly, if you fix with paraformaldehyde and then only use Triton X100, which is a common condition people use for immunostaining. So even during that well-accepted approach, you're losing a significant amount of protein from your samples. This, this approach also protects the endogenous uh, fluorescence from YFP. And one, one negative of this that I, are, I think I already mentioned is that there's significant tissue swelling uh, with this approach, which is a downside of this approach. So in the absence of the paraformaldehyde, the tissue swells quite a bit more. So Ben also tried uh, multiple different detergents and different concentrations of SDS and found that SDS worked better than any of the other detergents that he tried and that 8% SDS was the optimal uh, concentration both lower as well as higher SDS concentrations uh, did not result in even uh, clearing of the tissue throughout the entire sample. So with this new uh, method, which we call uh, PACT for passive clarity technique, uh, Ben was able to clear t thick tissue blocks of around a millimeter thick here uh, and do immunostaining for antigens more quickly 
than with the previous clarity protocols. So here's an example of tyrosine hydroxylase staining in the substantia nigra of the mouse brain. And you can, I think, appreciate how nice it is to actually see this in three dimensions rather than in thin slices where you only see a few cells each. So this process was also compatible with multiple labels. So here you can see uh, GFAP immunostaining in green uh, on the left, showing astrocyte processes contacting this ves uh, vessel, the brain, as well as uh, been added an anti-mouse IgG antibody to label the, the antibodies present in the mouse vasculature, and an IBA1 antibody to label microglia uh, in this brain tissue, and you can then see the overlap of all of these. So this PAC protocol should be useful then in studying the three-dimensional relationships between so different cells, processes, or molecules uh, after multiple antigen labeling. So it's not j just protein that this process maintains. We next showed in collaboration with Long Kai's group that, that PAC protocol also maintains uh, RNAs even to the level that you can do single molecule fluorescent C2 hybridization, which is what's shown here. So for this experiment, 100 micron mouse brain sections were incubated with probes or oligoprobes against beta-actin that were, la that were labeled with Alexa 594. And you can see, especially in these high power images, individual uh, puncti for the beta-actin, uh, the probe for the beta-actin mRNA. Uh, the yellow is these yellow dots are autofluorescence showing up in multiple channels. And you can see that in uncleared tissue, there's a lot more autofluorescence, such that when you look at the signal-to-noise signal ratio, uh, in the packed cleared tissue, there's much better signal-to-noise than in the uncleared tissue. And that you don't actually lose the true signal, just the noise. So PACT offers. Uh, several advantages over the previous clarity methods. One is it's faster and provides very complete clearing. Uh, it has enhanced antibody penetration due to the larger pore size. And it also maintains the proteins and nucleic acids, such that it is then compatible with the exi existing uh, techniques, including endogenous fluorescence, immunostaining, and fluorescence E2 hybridization. The disadvantages are that it is still a challenge to do very thick tissue, and uh, there's significant tissue expansion. So Ben then wanted to try to see if he could improve this method even further. Uh, so as a first step in speeding up the process, Ben tried doing immunostaining by delivering antibodies, or in this case on the left, nanobodies, uh, through the vasculature to see if he could speed up the labeling process. So first he perfused the animals as normal and then used a vasculature to distribute the antibodies. Fusion. He then fixed the samples again to lock in the antibodies in place and then took the brains out and cleared them passively. By pre-labeling with the GFP antibody, he could see labeling in astrocytes within the brain surrounding these blood vessels. This is a high, higher power view. <clears throat> and this suggested that at least for small antibodies like these nanobodies used here, they could be delivered across the vasculature and bind their targets. And he also showed that this could be done with a full-length antibody to uh, anti-mouse IgG perfused into the brain. So then th this raises the possibility that the entire fixation, permeabilization, clearing, and labeling process could all be done to, using the vasculature to more quickly evenly deliver the reagents. So, and this resulted in the, the method that we call perfusion-assisted or agent release E2. So basically what's done here is you perfuse the animals with PFA as normal, wash this with PBS to remove the, the, any free uh, formaldehyde, and then, then perfuse in the acrylamide monomers using the same packed solutions that I described previously or described in the paper. And then once that proceeds overnight or so, then you can initiate that and then clear with the same 8% SDS solution used 
uh, in the PAC protocol. Uh, but instead, unlike the PAC protocol where this happens in a tube, in this case, everything is happening by prevention. And so what this looks like is, well, it's not pretty, I guess, but here you can see a comparison between the uh, uncleared brain and internal organs of a mouse compared to uh, after the PARS-based clarity process where you can see the brain is much more transparent and the peripheral organs are also much more transparent. So hopefully you can see, or maybe not see, actually, the individual organs after whole body clearing through the vasculature. So when PARS was then used to clear a thigh one YFP transgenic mouse, the, the fluorescence from the YFP positive neurons <clears throat> could be seen throughout the brain in this wide field image on the left, or in progressively higher magnification images taken from this original image. In addition, the images in B show a single column that is a 3D representation of a Z-stack made by imaging through the surface of the brain. So what you're seeing here, the face that you're seeing is actually the reconstructed Z-stack uh, looking from images taken from the top and going down into the brain. So I think you can appreciate that this approach allows you to image deep within the tissue. It shows the cortical layers on top, the corpus callosum, and hippocampus here below. <clears throat> and importantly, despite the fact that there was also some swelling in the PARS-treated tissue, there was no evidence to suggest that gross changes in neuron neuronal morphology occurred as a result of the PARS process and post-PARS expansion. So you could see details down to individual lines here. Okay. So the PARS technique not only allows one to image endogenous fluorescence in the brain, but it also allows one to, to actually deliver uh, stains and reagents to, throughout all the tissues in the animal. And this, of course, can uh, be done in multiple organs at once. So here are images taken from the mouse intestine. In the left-hand panel, this is a uh, fluorescently tagged lectin that you can see highlights some uh, of the enteric neurons in the intestine. Methylene blue here in red, as well as DAPI in blue showing the <coughs> showing which labels the DNA and shows the nuclei as well as a, a composite of all of these stains together. This can not just be used to deliver small molecule stains, but if you have a cheap source of a lot of antibody, you can actually do immunostaining through the vasculature as well. So this is a PARS-treated animal that then had perfusion of a anti-tubulin antibody. Uh, and this is in the kidney, showing the nephrons of the kidney. Uh, as well as staining for the nuclei <clears throat> with uh, this far red DNA binding marker. So how is PARS done? Well, first, we, we do the whole process in a homemade chamber. And a couple of these figures are available in the paper. Uh, basically, what this chamber looks like is it's made out of a tip box, which most everybody has a widely available to them in the lab. Uh, the advantages of the tip box that make them quite nice is that, one, we have free access to lots of them after we use the tips. Uh, they have a easy to open and close lid that can be used to prevent or at least reduce evaporation. They have a platform here with lots of holes that, can, that allows the fluids that have been passed through the animal to then flow back into the chamber. And they have the nice. Pla they have a lower chamber that can be used to hold the liquid that is going to be refused, and they also have thin walls that can be used or that can be penetrated pretty easily with a soldering iron to make holes to run the tubing through. So, in this middle image, you can see how we set up the tubing. We have one tube that comes in, so this is going to be the outflow from the box, taking the solution up from the box out of this to the peristaltic pump and then returning back to this tube 
and which comes up and is routed up through the platform and then into the left ventricle of the animal. <clears throat> so for the degassing step, when you have the initiator present and you want to polymerize the acrylamide, uh, we put the chamber in a plastic Ziploc bag and seal it as much as possible and then run a nitrogen gas line through uh, into the bag to, to remove as much of the oxygen as possible. And we found that this is sufficient to, to allow the polymerization to occur. Um, and we also leave the tip boxes typically in the plastic bags for the rest of the steps of the procedure just to further minimize uh, the risk of evaporation. So the over, overall, the steps of this, the protocol are one, to do, to flush out the blood from the animal, then perfuse with PFA, uh, as you would typically for other immunostaining protocols, then uh, do a PB or PBS wash uh, for a couple hours to remove any free uh, PFA, then infuse in the acrylamide monomers, usually at least for eight hours or overnight, and then the next day, come in and initiate polymerization by putting it into the chambers I just discussed and increasing the temperature to 37 degrees. And it's important here, too, to note that when you, we do this by putting the boxes into a water bath, but if you have a significant amount of the tubing that is outside of the water bath, the, the actual temperature of the solutions coming back into the animal will likely be significantly less than 37. So that is something you have to pay attention to. So then after the initiation of the polymerization, which we let go for a couple hours, we then uh, clear with SDS. And this can take anywhere from a day or two to up to a week or so if you're interested in the brain. Uh, the brain still clears more slowly than most of the other peripheral tissue, especially in mice. <clears throat> so. Following the SDS, we then wash for a few days with phosphate buffer or PBS. Uh, and this, this step is particularly important, of course, if you're going to do immunostaining afterwards, but it's also just generally a good idea to get rid of the SDS from the tissue for the clarity process. And this is done not with uh, recirculating buffer, or you could do it with recirculating buffer, but if you do, then you should exchange it many times maybe eight times or so over the course of the two days to get rid of all the SDS. Alternatively, you can set up a very large uh, uh, container of, of your PBS and actually just let that run through without recirculation. So then after this is washed, then you can do your whatever steps are necessary for your right, visualization of the molecules of interest. And then once that's done and washed, then you equilibrate the tissue in a uh, refractive index matching media. And this typically will be done, depending on the tissue size, for a day or up to a week or so if the tissue is quite thick. And then, finally, you can mount an image. So the other uh, contribution we made in the cell paper is to develop uh, new options for the tissue for the refractive index matching. So <clears throat> focus clear works reasonably well, but was prohibitively expensive for this application as it's optimal to use a large excess of the uh, refractive index uh, matching media to equilibrate the tissue. <clears throat> and glycerol uh, gives rather suboptimal uh, uh, matching. However, the new s solutions, which the recipes are in the paper, uh, can provide much, much better matching. And you can adjust the, the refractive index of the RIM solution uh, by adjusting the concentration of the reagent. So most of the time we're using a histodense reagent, the RIM, which is here, and you can adjust the concentration to get the, the actual refractive index that will best match your tissue. So the nice thing about the RIM solution is that it not only matches the refractive index of the tissue, uh, rendering them much more transparent, but it also provides a solution for long-term storage of the tissue. And so this is an example of a, a, a whole brain that has been stored in the RIM solution for three months, 
and even after this time, it was possible to vis visualize the endogenous uh, YFP expressed uh, from this transgenic animal. So another, another option uh, for instead of whole body perfusion base clearing is, that was described in the paper is a, a clearing method that is localized to the central nervous system by infusing the, all the steps through the CSF rather than through the vasculature. So in this approach, you take a cannula and put it into, into the brain, under the, or not into the brain, but on the surface of the brain, under the dura, cement this in using dental acrylic, uh, and it can be done either here by the factory bulbs or back uh, in the space just by the cerebellum. And this approach is nice in that it could be used to limit the total amount of reagents you have to deliver for clearing. Uh, for either large animals or for just CNS-specific applications, and this works quite well for clearing the spinal cord. <clears throat> so my interest in this, uh, in the clarity protocols, has been to look at uh, AV serotype tropism as well as to do some individual cell phenotyping. So. This is an example also from the paper where we are looking at AV9 uh, transduction. So the AV9 here is, is providing expression of GFP. So you can see GFP positive neurons and glia in the brain of the mouse after IV injection of the AV9. And we can not only look in the brain for the cells that are transduced by the virus, but also look in peripheral organs to see what the overall tropism of the virus is and compare this virus to other novel viruses that we're developing that have uh, uh, different tropisms. So in this case, this is a virus that, like AV9, crosses the blood-brain barrier and can transduce neurons. However, it's also largely detargeted from the liver. I think you can appreciate the difference between the AV9 transduced liver and the one with the novel AV. And we can also look at other organs. This is an image of the pancreas uh, after AV9 injection, and you can then you can use this as a way to see what cells are transduced by the virus. So for instance, you can see that there are some peripheral nerves transduced as well as uh, cells within the islets of the pancreas. Another application that we're, that we're exploring is to use clarity together with AAVs to do individual cell phenotyping both in the brain and in peripheral tissues. And here you can see a, a neuron on the surface of the uh, adrenal, or, uh, on the adrenal gland and see the extensive processes of this neuron in ways that weren't really possible uh, before. So now I just want to, before I finish, I want to talk about a few of the ongoing challenges with uh, the clear, this uh, approach, both the PACT and the ours based clarity approaches. And so one of them is the tissue swelling, so, which I've mentioned before. So. Tissue swelling is quite bad with PACT, and it may be a little bit better with PARS, but it's still a bit of a problem. And one way that Ben has found to get around this is to actually, after doing the clearing and everything with the PARS by uh, perfusion, then taking the tish tissue out, in this case the brain, and post-fixing it again in PFA. And the post-fixation step reduces the amount of swelling that can be seen as compared to uh, the tissue that is PARS cleared without a post-fix. However, you can also appreciate that it, it does decrease the clarity of the tissues somewhat. So this, the tissue swelling could be a problem for some applications, and so hopefully there's lots of people interested in trying to look for better polymers or hydrogels that could be used that don't cause as much tissue swelling. Another, another issue is that the brain is slower to clear than other organs using the PARS technique. And this is especially true in the mouse. The rats, actually, the brains seem to, to clear better and more consistently than mice and don't take quite as long. Uh, a a final, final issue that all of this brings up is, that, is imaging speed. So to generate these kind of images, if you're doing, especially if you do a tiled Z-stack images, image with quite a bit of depth can take many hours, uh, if not overnight or more, 
on a conventional confocal microscope. Uh, so these are some of the major issues that still need to be worked out. Uh, I just want to end by my part by, by giving an overview of how to make a decision about which uh, clarity protocol you might want to choose. So the PAC protocol, the passive clearing protocol, is really ideal for uh, thin or small organs or for sections of tissue around one to two millimeters thick. It's also, of course, going to be really your only option for clearing tissues that you might get from human samples or others that are already fixed. Uh, I also wanted to point out that it, it's quite useful for non-clarity applications as well. So the fact that the acrylamide hydrogel-based uh, preservation of the protein and nucleic acids allows you to uh, have a more uh, robust preservation of these samples so that you can then either uh, use harsher washing or stripping steps to do multiple antibody labeling, or uh, and it allows you to have enhanced permeability of the tissue that may allow you to get antibodies in that are typically difficult to stain with. A, for the PARS, based approach, uh, this is really great for clearing, uh, for rapidly clearing many peripheral, or peripheral organs as well as the entire organ intact, even, even the brain, although this takes a little longer. Uh, and this is really useful for studies like what I'm doing, looking at virus tropism where I want to look at multiple organs at one time. Another advantage of this that I see is that it allows you to image things in their normal context and structure. So for instance, if you're interested in imaging muscle and you want to cut a piece of that muscle and then do imaging, when that muscle isn't fixed to a slide, it's, it changes, the tension changes. And by actually imaging, the, let's say, the entire limb structure, you can maintain the normal tension on that image. And your images may look more like they actually well, may give you better information. Uh, it's, the PARS approach is also potentially really good for doing nerve and vascular studies where you want to study the, the, where, how these processes are traveling through three-dimensional space. And finally, the PARS-CSF approach is really good for rapid uh, localized clearing of CNS tissue, and it's quite good for spinal cords as well as uh, they have application for rats or larger animals if you don't want to clear the entire animal. So with that, I'd like to end and just thank some of the people uh, involved in the project. And this work was done um, under the support and guidance of Viviana Gradnaro, a young faculty member here at Caltech. And the work was mostly driven by Bin Yang, the, who is here, and Jenny, and this is me. And I'd also like to thank all the other members of the Gradnaro lab that contributed to this project, as well as members of the Long Kai lab who helped with the uh, single molecule fish studies. With that, I will end, and thank you mu very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Deverman, for your presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's second and final speaker, Arvan Tully. Arvan is an advanced application scientist for Bitplane. He provides advanced imaging solutions for researchers and he specialized in multidimensional high-resolution image acquisition, microscopy systems troubleshooting, image analysis, and experimental design to facilitate image analysis. I would like to hand over to Arvan to begin his presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. And today, I would like to take you on a brief tour of some of the images that uh, the lab have been working on and to show you some ways that you can use Inaris or other applications to uh, examine this data and learn more about the interactions of these neurons and different cell types. <clears throat> so uh, let's get started. So here is one of the images from, from the paper. And uh, as you can see, we've got a roughly half a millimeter by half a millimeter by half a millimeter of uh, mouse spinal tissue and we can we can see how that looks and um, 
in this tissue. Uh, we, can, we can take a look and see as we rotate this in the live image. We can see how we see the structure of these cells, and we can see, and this is roughly <coughs> um, what's going on in the tissue here. Uh, we can also, um, by changing the lookup tables and the coloring and the visualization in this image, we can um, pull back the different channels and take a look and get a better idea of the structure of these images. So I'm going to change the colors now, and um, we can now zoom in and get a better idea of how these nerves are interacting and looking and uh, touching each other. And as I rotate this around, um, we can zoom in and get a closer look and see what's going on here. And as we change to the different visualization modes from a maximum intensity projection to a blend projection, this is an alpha blending projection, and it's going to show uh, the voxels and the different parts of the image um, differently. And so as opposed to just showing the brightest voxels, the blend mode shows the, uh, the voxels that are closer to you will obscure voxels which are further away. And this allows us to really get a very good three-dimensional view and see how these different um, neurons, these different motor neurons in the mouse spinal tissue are interacting with each other. And so we can really get a close look and and this uh, powerful visualization technique is going to give us a very good idea and enable us in the future to, to make nice measurements and really understand how these different neurons are interconnecting and how these different neurons are um, interacting with each other. And so it's nice to be able to see that, but um, even better still, uh, what we would like to be able to do uh, is to, of course, get some measurements and analysis out of this. And so using the tools provided by Ameris, well, we can go in, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on some previously uh, performed visualization, and I can check that on and uncheck this. And now when we go out, we can see that it is possible to reconstruct all of the neurons in this entire volume and see and start to look at these different neurons and see how they're touching each other and find where the interactions are. Now, unfortunately, uh, on this relatively small sample, many of the neurons are uh, going outside of the, uh, the volume, but this still enables us to see many connections right in the, uh, the middle here. So if I zoom all the way in, we can see some of these very interesting connections um, and see how the different neurons are uh, looping around and touching each other. And so it's very easy to go through and see uh, you know, how all these very complex uh, networks are and different uh, branches of the neurons are touching each other. <clears throat> So one question that uh, people might have is, you know, if we start to, now that, now that we can actually go through and segment these neurons and find the different parts of the neurons, uh, you know, what, you know, can we use this information to now answer questions like what is the branching order or the volume or the specific parts of these neurons uh, in order to answer some question? Um, so one thing that we might be able to do is we can actually, because we have measured these, now we know about the branching order. So we could go in and say, um, I'm going to turn off these neurons and turn on a limited subset. And with these, um, what we can see here, I'm going to turn on my color bar, and we can see the dendrite branching level. So we can see in this, in this particular area here, um, you know, how these, how these different neurons are interacting with each other, it looks like. I'm missing one there. There we go. Sorry, I was missing one of them. So we can see that in this case there are some primary neurons, I'm sorry, some primary branches <coughs> that um, are interacting with um, some secondary branches in this particular um, area. And so uh, Unfortunately, I'm not a, a full neuroscientist, so I can't tell you what that means, but I'm sure some people are very interested in that. And 
uh, th this tool can be then used to export all of this information and do uh, statistical analyses and compare the various different uh, uh, neurons between the different samples. And um, the software enables you to do that. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to just go out and, and just show, show people how you can actually use the software to either automatically or uh, manually go through and do some of this work. So now what I'm going to do is I'd like to give you a very brief demonstration on how you might use the software to reconstruct some of these neurons. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this off. Turn, off, turn on the complete structure, zoom out, and then go to some prepared neurons that uh, I had not finished uh, segmenting in this image. And so what we can do is we can go ahead and take a look at these, and I can overlay the volume in the original image so we can see where we might want to go through and manually guide the software to uh, make some measurements. So what I'm going to do here <coughs> is uh, select one of these objects. In this case, I'm going to select. So we'll work with uh, filament six here. And what I can then do is highlight this uh, starting point here. And then we can tell the software that we're going to manually guide the different uh, areas and the different branches. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just tell the software to go through and find a path right here. And so all I'm doing is just doing a quick drawing on the screen, and then the software is going to say, aha, we found the bright intensity and the line on this area. Uh, and then what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to tell it, we're going to have to select this line that we just drew, and then we're going to have to tell it to find the diameter and make sure we're getting a correct diameter. So I'm going to tell it which channel and some different parameters. And then you'll see that it goes through and uh, corrects the diameter for that structure. And then more or less all we have to do at this point is uh, wash, rinse, and repeat and continue doing this. So for this sort of work, um, as you go through and continue to uh, draw the various portions of the structure. Uh, you can see that it really doesn't take a terribly long time to do, and uh, you can you can do this quite quickly. Um, and what you can do with this is it's possible to go through and of course get all the different branching structures, and the software will automatically assign the different branch levels. And um, as you go through and you build up, one of the things that's very important to, to using uh, the three-dimensional view is that we can go through and look exactly at the structure and see which is the better path to take, and we can rotate this around. If you're only, we can also adjust the various intensity levels and seeing you know, where is the actual structure, which is the better path to follow, which makes more sense. And this is a much more uh, powerful way of tracing through this uh, expansive volume of the image and reconstructing the objects. So um, that's, that's more or less it, and that's what I wanted to show you guys today. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I think now we can go ahead and answer any uh, questions that people have. Yes, thank you very much, Arvan, for your presentation. So I can see you've all been very busy sending through questions for our speakers, so thank you very much for that. Uh, our first question uh, from a viewer who mentioned that he experienced uh, when performing transcardial perfusion fixation in mice, a decreased flow rate of the fixative after about 10 minutes, and he was wondering how you were able to maintain a steady flow of the PAR solution throughout the vasculature. Yeah, so this is Ben. Um, it's an interesting question. We haven't had that problem, but I don't know from the question whether the question is whether there's a problem with the flow rate from the pump going into the heart or if there's a problem with flow coming then out of 
the hole that they would cut for that for the, the fluid to come out of the, the atrium of the heart. Um, so it's difficult for me to answer that. We haven't seen that. I guess you know we typically try to achieve a, fl a flow rate of around one to two mils per minute, uh, and it may just be an issue with their pump. Sometimes I've found that our pump does a little bit better at giving a constant flow rate if it's a little bit elevated from the animal, so you get a little bit of a gravity assist. Um, other than that, I'm not sure because we haven't experienced that problem. We have a second viewer who is asking uh, whether uh, this technique would work in a tissue that is composed mostly of collagen, such as musculoskeletal tissues. Yeah, we've we've had success using in muscle. We've definitely I've taken myself some nice images of uh, muscle. Um, I don't think that should be a problem. Although I haven't been able to image down many millimeters, maybe a half a millimeter, a little bit more into muscle, should be possible. And as far as the collagen goes, you he, the you may want to try just adjusting the refractive index of the of the embedding media because the collagen is dense and may require a higher refractive index. So you could take use the rims or adjust the rims uh, recipe to give a higher refractive index, but I don't know exactly what numbers he should try to start with. It might just have to be figured out empirically. We have another viewer here that was uh, mentioning that when clearing the whole mouse brain for seven days, he still had uh, not fully cleared the mid areas like the hippocampus and the corpus callosum. Do you have any suggestion for successfully clearing the whole brain provided uh, he or she is using the extended SDS incubation period? Yeah, I mean, the, the, it varies a little bit from animal to animal, and I think if seven days isn't enough, the solution is just to keep clearing until it is cleared. It should get there eventually. Um, it, I don't know. It's, that's, it depends, too. I guess if the uh, question is about the PAC protocol or, or PARS, if it's, if it's a problem with the PAC protocol and they're just not clearing the, the internal part of the tissue, then they may want to try the PARS protocol where that shouldn't be as much of a problem. Although the white matter tracks are always the slowest to clear, uh, regardless of which method you use. Another viewer was wondering whether we can apply this technique for the in vivo analysis of the working of the brain. Well, if, if they can, then they will probably get many cell papers out of that. <laughs> that would be quite an advance. Uh, we don't have a way to do that currently. <coughs> And how are the sample stores stored after clearing? Solution, temperature, light, uh, do you know how long that they remain useful? Uh, so, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think we, we store them in rims, the, in the chambers that we actually image them on. So you can put your tissue in a slide within a chamber uh, as long as it is well sealed so that there's no evaporation loss, uh, then you should be able to store it in rims at room temperature for months. I mean, since this is fairly new, we haven't gone years yet, but uh, it should be good for many months if the signal is quite strong. And I don't recommend that they would store it at four degrees. I don't know long term what that would do, but in my experience, when you move the tissue to four degrees, it becomes less less clear. So. There may be precipitation from any, like a small amount of remaining SDS or something like that that is, that is causing it to become less clear. That, some of that resolves when you move it back up to room temperature, but it's best to just store it at room temperature. And uh, sorry, one other point on that too is that there's, it's probably helpful, although maybe not completely necessary, depending on how you want to, how long you want to store it. But it's probably helpful to put sodium azide in the rim solution as well to prevent any bacterial growth over long-term storage. Another viewer was wondering if you ever tried imaging those cleared samples with 
uh, SPIM, LSFM, or have you primarily used confocal microscopy? Well, unfortunately, we've primarily used confocal microscopy because we don't have <laughs> those microscopes available. But uh, you know, in, in, in the Dyseroff lab at Stanford, they are using light sheet microscopy and, and finding that it saves tremendous amounts of time. So we are hoping to be able to do that in the near future. And is it possible to perform double or triple immunostaining with the PARS or PAC technique? Yes, with the PAC technique, well, with both of them, it should be possible. There really shouldn't be any differences. But with the PAC technique, we actually showed it in the cell paper. There's a figure with uh, triple amino staining, as I gave in the talk as well, with IBA1, GFAP, and the anti-mouse IgG staining. So we did do triple, triple amino staining with the PAC technique, and there's no reason that it should not also be possible with PARS. All right, so I'm afraid that's all the questions that we have time for. Thank you for your particip participation and submitting some excellent questions. Any questions that we were unable to answer today due to time constraint will be passed on to the speakers, who will then try to contact you later on with an answer. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all speakers for their presentations today, and to also thank the attendees of today's webinar. This has been a very informative webinar with a lot of thoughtful questions and answers, so thank you. Thank you. Further information on the When Size Matters series of webinars can be found at www.bitplane.com forward slash sumo. Here you can find recordings of previous webinars and upcoming webinars in the series. The next webinar in the series is upcoming on November the 5th and features a talk on whole brain imaging with serial two-photon tomography. You can follow the conversation on Facebook and Twitter by using the hashtag WhenSizeMatters. Also, we'll be at the upcoming Society for Neurosciences meeting in Washington, D.C. on the 5th till the 19th of November. So come by the booth to see Amaris 8 for the first time and play our SNF uh, 2014 game and maybe win a prize. So don't forget there will be a recording of this webinar that will be also available online very shortly. Thank you everyone and hope you have a great day.